Alrighty guys, welcome to the third and last part of my build series on this low layer count Damascus buoy. We have a ton to get covered here, so let's get started. Step one is going to be the front spacer and getting it ground down to its final height dimensions, which is in line with the height of the Picasso. We'll end up using this to shape the height of the handle block as well. With the knife assembled, I'll use the height gauge to scribe in some lines along the length of the handle block that are parallel to the Ricasso. Grinding to these lines will ensure that the handle block is centered and parallel with the blade. This is where a precision cut wood template really comes in handy. I line up the wood template with the Ricasso, square it to the front of the handle block, and trace it onto the block. This gives me a rough line to cut to and grind to when profiling the handle. We can then begin to shape the handle, starting with angling the front of the handle down to the desired thickness of the front spacer, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of three quarters of an inch. I can then, in true Kyle Royer fashion, use my two inch contact wheel to start shaping the back of the handle. Don't get me wrong, I like the way that this handle turned out, but I do think that in the future, I may work on getting the front of the handle more oval. This one is just a little blocky. It's still comfortable and attractive, but I'll just store that away in my mind for the next build. On the hand finishing bench, I start off with this fine cut six inch tapered half round file. I really like this file and consider it well worth the price tag. If you're interested in picking one up, I'll put an affiliate link to it in the description below. Once my shape is dialed in, I'll take this handle up in the grits until I get to 1200, and then I'll move on to the front spacer. Since the handle is now shaped very close to its final dimensions, you can use it as a template for the front spacer. Note I undersized the front spacer so that I have an heirloom fit. I decided to go out of my normal comfort zone with the shape of this guard. Using my laser cut template from the last video, I am able to get the shape scribed into the front of the guard using the Ricasso as a reference point. I then very carefully cut and ground down to this scribed line on the guard. To add to the flowiness of the knife and overall finish, I decided to try and round over or dome the edges in the guard. This took a little time, but was well worth it in my opinion. I sanded the guard up to a 600 grit, hit it with the Scotch-Brite wheel and belt, and then finally with green compound on my new buffer, buffed it out. Back on the blade, I etched in my maker's mark. One of these days, I'm going to find an easier way to get all this lined up. I always end up spending a lot of time fiddling around with the stencil. Some viewers have suggested putting down a mask on the blade, laser etching away the mask, and then electrochemical etching the blade itself. I still need to try this. I then etched the blade in ferric chloride, followed by an instant coffee etch. While the blade was in the coffee, I got started on the guard and front spacer in the ferric chloride.
when the blade came out of the coffee, I decided to use a technique I found on my fantasy knife build and sand the blade with 1200 grit sandpaper. This really brightens up the 15 and 20 and leaves a really cool zebra-like contrast on the blade. With the blade done, I rounded over the front of the handle for the heirloom fit and then buffed it on the buffer. This wood really did turn out very nice. The glue up on this piece is a little complicated. I start off by mixing up a batch of JB Weld and one batch of G-Flex. The JB Weld will be used on the metal to metal surfaces and the G-Flex on the wood handle. I make sure to get some JB Weld around the front of the guard, just in case there is some tiny voids here and there from etching the wrought iron. If there are any voids, I'd rather have them filled with a metal colored JB Weld than left open. With the guard and front spacer on, I slathered up a good deal of G-Flex in the handle and pushed it up onto the tang, making sure to keep my finger over the finial hole. I then tightened up the whole assembly, making sure everything went on evenly. The last part of the process is spending about 15 or 20 minutes wiping off any of the excess glue off camera. Once the handle epoxy has had time to cure, I wrap up the blade, cut off the finial, grind it close to flush with the wood, file it flush with the handle block, hand sand it, and then bring it up to a 1200 grit finish, and finally buff it on the buffer. Some of the last steps here in the blade is to have it sharpened up on the stones. After sharpening the blade on the stones, I consider the blade finished and I put it aside to start working on the sheath. This is going to be the most complicated sheath that I've ever made. I spent a lot of time watching and re-watching Paul Long's advanced sheath making DVD, which I highly recommend. Using my X-Tool laser, I cut out the basic pieces for my sheath out of 8 ounce Wicked & Craig Vetch Tan leather. To get the leather I have to the appropriate thickness for a liner, I purchased a manual leather splitter. The mechanical versions of this machine can be over $800, but this little guy came in at under $150. I did a couple of test cuts with it on some old pieces of scrap and made sure that I had my thicknesses dialed in. I'm shooting for around a two ounce leather, which is around one millimeter thick. If y'all are interested in me doing a full review of this machine, let me know in the comment section. In the meantime, I'll put a link to this item in the description of the video. For the inlay of the sheath, I'm going to go with a piece of Stingray that I got from Tandy. This stuff is pretty tough and I probably dulled the heck out of my scissors here. With a sheath like this one, there is a ton of gluing. And it may be hard to tell here, but my contact cement, I didn't have any thinner on hand for this sheath build, but I definitely ordered some barge glue thinner for my next one. I hope that brings this can of barge back to life.
It was around this time that I was really wishing for a sewing machine. Hand saddle stitching the chevron and stitch down liner on the front pieces of the sheath didn't really feel ideal, but it got the job done. You may be able to see in some of these shots that my front pieces with the window cut into them is a little thick, which causes the chevron to have a hump in it and the inlay to sit a little deeper than I'd like. In the future, I'll split these front pieces that have windows and I may even leave the chevron a little thicker. I purchased this stainless stud from Tandy and use some JB Weld on the threads to make sure it never moves. With the front of the sheath finished up, I glued in the welt and the back piece. I then started cleaning up the edges on my belt sander. I start with a 120 grit belt and worked up to a 320 grit belt in combination with some saddle soap. This gives me a really good starting point for finishing my edges later in the build. Now that the edges are leveled, I can bevel the corners and put in my stitching groove on the front of the sheath. I also use some cheap pricking irons here to mark out where I want my holes to be for drilling. Using a big needle in my mini mill, I puncture holes along my stitch line. This method isn't perfect, but it is faster than using a set of pricking irons going through multiple pieces of leather. I use a stitch groover to connect the holes on the back of the sheath and then get the saddle stitching. Nowadays, I calculate 10 times the length of the stitch just to make sure I have enough thread. The last part of the process is sanding up the edges of the sheath to a slick 600 grit and then dyeing them with black leather dye. Alrighty guys, so this is our final product here. I'm extremely happy with how this sheath turned out. This is the first inlay that I've ever done, and I think it looks really good. The lining on the front and the back pieces of the sheath also turned out pretty good. And it's the first time that I've ever done a stud like this on a sheath. So lots of firsts for me, and it all turned out uh, satisfactory for sure. One thing to note is that this is a very popular style sheath in the buoy world. It allows the user to wear this under their belt with the stud acting as a stop. You could also fashion a leather frog for this sheath that wraps around it and has a belt loop off of the back. So with that, I'm going to put the knife into the sheath for the first time and hope that it fits. Note that I used a thinner welt uh, then I could have. I had a thicker welt that I had also cut out and I decided to go with the thinner welt because I'd rather have a tighter fit than a looser fit and I figured the leather could stretch a little bit if need be. So here we go. We're going to get this guy going in here. It's a little snug but not too bad. That's actually perfect. That's exactly what I would hope for. All right so that's the whole package there all together and I think it's fairly attractive. Let's see. It's in there really tight, it's not coming out. So yeah, you know, the user could put this whole thing under their belt and they could have their knife like that uh, or as a display piece, whatever, whatever the user would like to do with this thing. Overall, I'm very happy with this package. There are a few minor things that I don't like. Uh, the first and foremost on the sheath, this point on the chevron's a little too pointy. Over the years, I feel like it could get rounded up and uh, probably look unattractive. So in the future, I'll probably round over points like this. Uh, also, that stitch doesn't quite line up with the, with the point in the center there. So that's just a small cosmetic thing. Uh, when it comes to the knife itself, I'm very happy with the overall look of the knife. The rod iron on the guard and front spacer are awesome. Uh, the construction is solid. The tang goes all the way through the handle. It's epoxied on with the finial on the back. Now that tang is a little thinner than I would like. However, I tested it multiple times during the construction process and it seems like it held up pretty good. So I don't think I would cut a tree down with this or try a 90 degree flex test, but as a general using knife, I think it will do just fine. 
So yeah, that's the entire package. I plan on putting this knife up on my website for sale if anyone is interested in purchasing it. And I uh, hope y'all really enjoyed the video series here. This was a very fun knife to make. And there were a lot of key features that I wanted to highlight during the construction of this knife. You know, I'm finally feeling a little more confident with this style of knife, this uh, hidden tang design on forged knives. So I'm excited to continue my learning and uh, present it to you guys. So with that, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you liked it, hit the like button, consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll catch you all on the flip side.